want to. Okay. So we are All live. Right. Hi, Richard. Hello, Tanya and everyone else. <laughs> So welcome to today's Jewelry Makers Guild live podcast, where we dive into the creating driving forces of our fellow jewelers. I'm Tanya Davidson, the creator of the Jewelry Makers Guild and a fellow maker of 24 years. It's my quest to learn as much as I can, learn as many techniques and try as many materials and to share that information with other artists. So I thought it would be fun to do a visual podcast to find out what inspires our fellow artists and makes their work so amazing. So please help me welcome to my podcast, Richard Sally. Hi, Richard. Hello, everyone. Thanks Hello, for coming. Thank you. thank you for your time. Thank you. Excellent. You bet. So to introduce you, Richard began working in metal in 1969 as an assistant to metal sculptor Malcolm Moran in Carmel, California. He went on to graduate from the University of California and became a teacher in the California public school systems. I bet you have some stories to tell where he taught for 32 years. He, while mostly self-taught in jewelry making, Richard has studied with some notable jewelry artists, including Keith LeBeau, Robert Danzig, Susan Lennar Katzmer, Ann Mitchell, and Charles Luton Brain. Richard retired from teaching in public schools to devote more time to his art and teaching workshops around the country. So you can find him this year or next year at four places at least. And he considers himself not so much a jeweler, but rather a maker of wearable art. His interests include okay. digital art, mixed media collage, assemblage, sculpture, and jewelry. Richard's work has been featured in Bellamar Jewelry, Art Jewelry, and Jewelry Artist Magazines, and other published work can be seen in books, Making Connections, Steel Wire Jewelry, steampunk style jewelry and metal style. Richard and his lovely wife, Jane, who I love, reside in Rio Vista, California. Um, as we talk, Richard, I'm gonna be showing some of your slides of your work. So if there's anything you'd like right. to add, um, don't hesitate to interrupt me and tell me about those pieces. I'm sure everybody would like to hear about it. It's, we don't okay. see any comments, but after the podcast, you might wanna go and just peruse the comments to see if there's anything that you would like to answer that they asked. So y'all can oh, okay. put your questions there if you'd like, and uh, you can even tag Richard in those comments. So let's dive in. So first, for almost all of us, there was a spark that led us down the path of creating. So I'm curious, can you share with us your earliest memory about making art? Well, um, it goes back to what was at that time called junior high school, grades seven, eight, nine. I guess they would call it middle school now or some, I don't know, some other arrangement. But uh, yeah, I had this eccentric kind of art teacher um, who she just made art fun and uh, she was just a wild crazy woman <laughs> and uh, so I took art classes with her for all the three years that I was uh, in middle school there junior high school and she just made me think that I could do art I don't know if I was really any good but she made me think I was so uh, from that point on then I just took art classes in high school as many as I could and uh, then I went on to uh, to a junior college, and um, I thought that I could do the same thing. But I found out really there were people who were a lot better than I was, and I ended up uh, changing majors really. But uh, I was kind of interrupted by a little skirmish over in Southeast Asia called the Vietnam War, so that interrupted my education. But uh, the upside of that was that after I got out of the military, I was stationed in Monterey, California, and uh, I got a job working for a metal sculptor. So that was my introduction to metal. And um, this uh, guy that I worked for, Malcolm, he was good friends with Clint Eastwood. So I don't know if any of you remember the movie Play Misty for me, but it was filmed there in Carmel where I worked and uh, in, the, in the gallery where I worked. So that was kind of fun. It was kind of an exciting time, but uh, eventually just being an assistant didn't pay very well. So I ended up going back to college and uh, got a <clears throat> teaching credential. I ended up with a degree in linguistics, which is far removed from art at all. But uh, I taught elementary, middle and high school. My last teaching assignment was teaching photography in high school, the wet darkroom situation. Um, and all along the way, I, I played with metal, uh, metal sculpture, but not, not jewelry until 
2002, I took a, a class with Keith Labou, and that was the uh, start of a jewelry making experience that uh, has kind of lasted for the last, whatever that is, 20 something years. Was that the, the class that he taught in Oregon with Michael Domingue? No, the class that I took with Keith was uh, in Arizona and uh, it was this very small group of people. It was like 10 people, uh, but it was sponsored by um, Sylvia Luna um, and it was in her, her mountain retreat home and Keith was there. And then the other really interesting thing that happened there was that Linda Young was one of the participants in the class and she happened to have just completed the first year of Art Unraveled in Arizona. And so she invited me then to teach the next year, but I didn't know anything about jewelry at that time to teach. So she invited me to teach. So I taught a photography class there right. and then the next year taught there again. I think I taught there like 13 years in a row. Um, and um, yeah, uh, Linda Young was really an impetus in getting me into the actual teaching part of that, and which led to other teaching assignments as well. Very cool. Um, I always think about a person's work as a quilt or a perfect stew, and I don't even cook, but th that seems to me to be a good analogy that each technique, each person we've met, um, each person we've studied under or the experiences that we've had, like the linguistics and those things that you did before become an ingredient in our work. And so I'm wondering who or what comprises the ingredients of your work today? Well, first of all, I would have to say my wife, uh, Jane, has been instrumental in you know, giving me the, the freedom and uh, the, uh, the ability to, to do this kind of work and been very supportive. So she's at the top of the list. Um, probably the second most influential person in my life has been Jessica Cote, who also known as Rosie Revolver, because mm -hmm. we worked together for about three years. And uh, that whole dynamic was really um, an, an experience that uh, is, is just at the top of my list for um, things related to this whole jewelry and art making experience. And then there have been a lot of people along the way. I've already mentioned Keith. Uh, you know, he was my first experience as a jewelry maker. And then right after that was Susan Leonard Kazmer and uh, followed by Robert Danzig and, and Thomas Mann. I mean, these people have all been really um, generous with their their time, their expertise. I, I don't know, I guess because they're all teachers, maybe they've just mm -hmm. been so generous, but they've been not, they're not guarded about their techniques or their, um, uh, oh, and besides expertise, what be their, their vision and just the way that they are um, willing to share, which is, I think, not terribly common in the, the artistic world. A lot of people would like yeah. to protect and think that they have a, you know, a corner on the market there. But uh, th those who are sharing are the ones who seem to be influencing more people and and those people have been really uh, generous with, with their knowledge for me and it's helped me grow i would say i'm mostly self-taught but it's it's not the most efficient way to learn sometimes um you know i took a five-day class with charles luton brain that probably saved me five years of learning mm -hmm. you know um so i support anybody who wants to do self-learning but i also like to have people um take classes and with me and with others and hopefully that will sh kind of uh, provide a shortcut to their growth uh, so i really appreciate those who have shared with me along the way and uh, I, I owe them a great debt of gratitude for being uh, being there to support me and to also be an instructor for me there's something to be said for um community and we talked about this before the show started about, you know, being around other artists, whether they're other students or the teacher and um, being in community with them and talking and, and hearing stories about where they come from. And a lot of those people you mentioned, I have take, taken classes with and they're, some of them are good friends and they all come from a real place of abundance where they, I think that's why they share because they don't feel this this need to come from a place of lack where they might, something might get stolen or there's never gonna be another idea that they have. And 
I, I love being around those kinds of people because they are so generous. Um, and in all the artists that have been willing to do the podcast have shared things about their work and themselves that people have not heard anywhere else. So I find that very, very um, rewarding and I love it. So thank you. Um, I think hey, that- You know, when I, when I first started, I was just thinking about this, uh, you know, Keith and Susan and uh, Robert Dancy, these people, I thought, you know, they're really heroes and unreachable. Thomas Mann, you know, but uh, once you got to know them, they were just like normal people. And, you know, they've got their own uh, fears and shortcomings and, uh, well, they're just regular people and yeah. uh, they're very down to earth. And that's really been insightful for me. Yes, I totally agree. Um, I, and along those lines, I think that the best art is made by people who are driven by an underlying need to communicate and leave their mark or to tell a story. Um, obviously, you do this in your work because your work is so story based to me. I see all sorts of stories. So um, what are you trying to commu communicate through your art? Oh, wow. I don't know. I don't think I'm that deep, really. <laughs> <laughs> I just make, I just make stuff. I don't know. I mean, I've always been a maker since I was a kid, you know, making model airplanes and model cars and I don't know, building soapbox derbies and things. I just make stuff. And I, 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 I would wish I were deeper and had some philosophical basis for all of these things, but, um, I'm just interested in putting things together and finding ways to, to make things that are, kind of interesting and beautiful and people like to wear them in some cases, but I have sculptures that are not wearable, obviously, and photography is another interest. So um, I don't know, I just driven to create and without much thinking about it. Did you ever hear Robert Danzig's story about his work that he did with the medical apparatuses? No. It, he he because it was along these lines and I'm like well what's the deeper meaning what's the story and it, the gist of it was it was called uh, Dr. Trebor's um, me apparatuses medical apparatuses okay. and he I went on with this that. long elaborate story about each piece and then at the end he just said well it's Dr. Trebor's Robert backwards I made it up and you should make up a story about your work because people get <laughs> more interested and they'll buy your work if you have a story and that was for me, uh, uh. a really funny story because, you know, you sometimes think this work is really deep, but maybe it's just that the person, you know, was drunk and splattered paint on the on the canvas, <laughs> not that there was like some deeper meaning to it. But right. a lot of artists get attached to their work and they have a hard time parting with it. And for others, it's about the journey of making the piece, the going through it, having an idea. And I know you have a lot of mechanisms and maybe for you, it's not this way, but for me, I'm always like, well, I'm gonna see if I can make this swing or this connect or, or I wanna try this. And so for me, it's about the journey, but I'm wondering what's more of an, a, an impetus or drive for you when you make your piece. Yeah, it's more of the journey. Um... And, and I usually set out to make something different each time or solve some problem or investigate some little uh, technique or, and I am interested in the mechanics and the, the engineering part of it. I mean, I, I was never a good in math student when I was in school, so I don't know where the engineering interest came from, but um, I do like to see things move and bend and, uh, hinges and locks and that kind of stuff. So, uh, yeah, the journey is, is part of it. And do, do I, I'm trying to think here, do I really, um, have pieces that I don't want to part with? There are very few, most of them, you know, I'm willing to, I'm not terribly attached. There are a few here and there and a few that I make special for special people sometimes that, um, that are more, I guess, attached to an emotional side than just a purely fabrication side. So, yeah, because I love how you always put together all these different um, materials and it's that mixed media effect um, and all the different connections that you have. So since you're not really having this underlying story you're trying to tell with your work <laughs> where do you get your inspirations for like now I've, I've seen the last year you're doing a lot of sayings that are etched in song 
words from right. songs that right. are were right. and you might mm -hmm. see them um is it do you have like this big closet full of, of mediums you know like different rulers and things that you have collected and you just open the closet and you say what am i going to create today what is your methodology for putting together what you're going to work on the next design uh it is kind of random um you know i mean some days it's you pick up uh, a stone uh, and say oh this kind of gives me an idea about you know a, a shape or a story or something and then it is uh, many um, times it has been recently music inspired pieces uh, or some kind of sayings or um, little quotes from here and there and it's it's purely random. I, I don't know. I mean, inspiration comes in very strange ways. It just uh, falls out of the sky. And I, I I don't know where it comes from or why or how, but, you know, you look at something and say, oh, rusty nails. Uh, oh, song about the bed of roses and sleeping on a bed of nails or something. You know? So it just comes together and it's it's uh the muse comes and goes and if you don't do something with it it goes to somebody else you know That's and right. uh, it uh t today it was working with rulers again and uh but uh, tomorrow might be something different <laughs> i don't I, I can't predict you know uh I, I lived in santa fe for five years mm -hmm. and i was really influenced of course there by the southwest um, you know, the Native American kind of stuff. So, I mean, that's why I have this on that I'm, um, this nice big piece of turquoise. And I'm working on, this is, a, this was a piece that I'm working on today was a lot, another big piece of turquoise and rulers and oh, nice. you know, that kind of stuff. So, um, but like I said, tomorrow might be, uh, one of Gary Wilson's, uh, Rosarita stones or something, you know? Just, and so do you I, do I any antique hunting to get the materials that you use or you get those online? Mm. Do you know, do you know, um, go out searching for a, a I ruler do, I, or did you just find those rulers? How does that? Uh, those, those, I, those are all the rulers I bought, I think on eBay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I was searching for vintage rulers. Vintage um, and then, yeah, if something comes up, it's, Ooh, yeah, that's an idea. Can I find a particular, where do I find rusty square nails and, uh, or, uh, I'm, I'm not a real scavenger, um, and I don't have a big collection of stuff. Uh, and I say that, and then I go, why don't I clean out this drawer? You know? <laughs> so um, I've got a lot of stuff that I don't, don't think I'll ever use, but when you throw it away, you want it the next yes. day. Yes. So I hang on, hang on to some things. But I'm not a real big uh, collector. I mean, I, I've been to Keith's place and seen his stuff, and, uh, you know, he's He's uh, beyond, uh, I wouldn't say hoarder, but he just got like a museum of stuff. Yeah. So I have a little bit of stuff. So do you ever, um, and I've taken, I took a class with Keith Lobo and Michael Deming together, and that was quite an experience. Mm. Um, a few days with one and then a few days with the other to create a shrine for the piece that you made to go inside of it. And that was really interesting. Um, but do you ever, uh, have a hard time letting go of like, you, maybe you got a whole bunch of rulers and you're like, no, I just can't cut this one up. I, I'm not ready to sacrifice it yet. I call it the sponge theory. <laughs> it was like Seinfeld oh, show when she wouldn't give up her sponges that were being, you know, deleted from the marketplace. <laughs> so she was like, it's not sponge worthy. Mm. And I think, well, this, this stone isn't worthy of this piece. I'm going to have to wait and use the stone later. So I have a hard, sometimes have a hard time using the things that I have. Do you ever find yourself or you just cut it up and go for it? Just cut it up and go for it. <laughs> I need yeah. more of that. Whatever that you've got, <laughs> I want more of that. Uh, I know I, some, uh, somebody wrote me about one of the pieces I do with the rulers that, oh, I have a big collection of vintage rulers, but I would never think of cutting them up. Mm -hmm. But I'm not attached to them. Yeah. Well, I need to, so, whatever uh, that gene is, I, I need more of that in my. I think they have more value in a piece that I create than in their original state. That's true. Yeah. yeah. You know. That's a really good way to look at it. Thank you. I will reframe that next time. Okay. <laughs> so do you have a favorite technique in your process, one that like sets you on fire that you love to do? So you love to be able to add that into that piece. I do love to do etching. 
uh, primarily with text. And um, I, I, I like to incorporate hinges and uh, mechanisms if I can. I don't know if that would be considered a technique, yeah. but uh, you know, a process anyway. Yeah. But etching, I, I do etching quite a bit. And, and interesting enough, that was the first class I ever took with Keith was an etching class. So it's, you know, it's come full circle. Um, I, I think that would probably cover it. So what does your perfect uh, studio day look like? Well, I guess it would be uh, to start and finish one thing that day, <laughs> <laughs> if I could do that. Sometimes I can, but many times not, you yeah. know, but there's a lot that goes on besides just the actual sitting at the bench itself. You know, I mean, there are emails to answer and there's, I mean, there are other things to, to get done. So I usually don't get started much before 9 a.m., you know, and I try to knock off about five. So, you know, I, I rarely work late into the night or anything but um yeah a good day would be try to finish one thing that i start are you a starter or finisher uh i like to get things finished so in a way that is because of an impatient kind of nature uh, so i sometimes take shortcuts that to fin get something finished that if I said, okay, I'll try to do it another day, I would probably take a little more time with something. So, um, I like to finish it, but you know, it's, uh, it has the downside of maybe being, uh, not as detailed as it could be. Do you ever work on pieces and you're just not sure where it's going to head? So you stick it in a drawer and wait for it to tell you where it needs to go. Once in a while, it's pretty rare, but there have been a few of those. Yeah, yeah. Uh, usually, I just kind of adjust on the fly. If it's not working, take it apart and redo it. Or say, well, that was a good idea when it started, but it didn't work <laughs> out that <to> way. <laughs> you know, the metal didn't quite bend like I thought it would, or you know, I melted something. So, I think you have to kind of adjust on the fly. Now, is there something that you do every day to like a ritual or something that you do to prepare yourself for a creative day? You know, baseball players have all these, all athletes have rituals. And so I think sometimes artists do that they're not aware of them, or maybe um, like you like to listen to something or I don't foresee a candle being lit in your future, but you know, this, some people have like a whole ritual before they, so they can put your, themselves into the mind of getting to work, like putting on an apron or. No. <laughs> you just go and get I'm to work. I'm not that deep. Is there coffee deep involved at least? <laughs> no. Um, I, I mean, not necessarily. Uh, before I get here, I don't drink coffee when I'm here. I usually have one cup in the morning. That's it. So by the time I get started, it's, uh, I'm just ready to work. I don't, uh, if I'm not, then don't don't start. You know? <laughs> Pick up the guitar and play or something. But, oh, so you do play the guitar? Yeah, yeah I, I see do. it now in the picture of your studio. Very nice studio, by uh, the way. Oh, it's very small. You know, I, I was relegated to the garage for a while. But I I didn't work as much as I could have because it was either cold or hot. And so mm -hmm. once we removed the carpeting from this one bedroom, I moved in here and put in vinyl or uh, what do you call it, kind of floor, laminated flooring. Yep. And um, with the carpet in here, it was impossible. So, so now I'm inside and I can work every day. <laughs> Air conditioning, so... I yeah. have that same flooring in my studio in Montana, and I cannot find stones when they fall on that floor. No, no. Well, you'll find something else that you <laughs> lost the previous day. Yes. <laughs> so um, let's talk about what's on your bench now, and maybe you can tell us uh, a little bit about the pieces that w I know you've completed this now. This was from, I think, last right. week, but maybe you can right. tell us a little bit about this process. I can't see the screen while we're looking at it. Uh, this looking is at the, the one uh, where the um, pieces of turquoise are on the metal and it's on your bench on the steel blocks. And 
It looks like oh, okay. you're, you just, your bench is an array uh, of mess. creativity. <laughs> uh, we call that creative clutter. Yes. <laughs> yes, that's the way it looks right now. Yeah, so that's, that's for real. And then this that's is stage. a process shot of um, the rulers oh, okay. have gotten their bezel caps on. and. Okay, right. Yeah, that's pretty much the steps. Work through the bezels. Oh, the butterfly. Yeah, and that, the butterfly. then there's also the butterfly um, hinge ring. That's really cool. Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah, a little uh, kinetic uh, butterfly ring. Mm -hmm. That's going to be, I think, a class in the future. Nice. After the class class, I think that, the kinetic uh, butterfly ring will be a class so, is there a spring in uh, there or is it just a bunch of parts connected together there is a, there is a spring actually yes there's nice. a spring in there um uh, i need to work on that a little bit more to get the details down but it, yeah it's uh try, the idea was to kind of make the wings move when you you know flex your fingers i think that's so, very cool fascinating yeah, it was fun so you um, said that you generally start working in your studio around nine. So a right. couple hours in the mornings, you are busy managing your business tasks like marketing, packaging, shipping, sourcing. So right. is that enough time for you to do your, your marketing and everything and then get to work every day? Or do you do some of that in the evenings or weekends? Um, mostly during the day. It's, it's really not that much. I mean, you know, may have one or two two orders or something to, to move out, but it, it's not terribly complicated. It's very low, low budget uh, kind of operation. And uh, you know, not not too demanding. Do you like doing social media marketing? Or do you have somebody that does that for you? No, no, I do everything. Um, and I try to post something on like Instagram every day. I was going to um, tell everybody to make sure that they watch your stories. Your stories are really interesting. And I think a lot of people forget about how great stories are. I, you know, the main pages of Instagram show the business things you want to show or your studio or your finished right. pieces. But people forget that the stories really give you insight into the person's creative process and their maybe even their lifestyle. And I find that so fascinating. I'm addicted to watching your stories. I'm on there watching them to see what you're creating, because I good. think it's really interesting. So I enjoy those a lot. Well, good. Thank you for telling me that. Um, yeah, I try to throw those process shots out there to kind of inspire people to, um, and they're kind of like freebie little ideas, starters, you know, little techniques maybe. Yeah. So. Yeah, well, and it's also like, well, how did he do that? Well, I'm going to go take his class because I want to figure out what that uh, step was. Right. There you go. <laughs> so it worked. See, I kind of, <laughs> like, kind of a teaser, I guess, in a way mm -hmm. to, uh, you know, get more detail. Yeah. Now, do you Stories enjoy the uh, selling process? The uh, And what is what is your favorite <clears throat> place to sell work that, like, do you like doing shows where you meet people or do you mostly sell online or is it in classes where people are seeing your work when they're as a student? What, what, what sort of is your favorite way to sell and how, what advice would you give to somebody who hates to sell that process? Well, online has worked pretty well during these COVID times, you know, I mean, that's just been about all there is. Um, pro before that, mostly I sold at the venues where I was teaching. Um, I, I, I've done a couple of those things where you put out a table and you put your things out there. I don't like that. I'm not a people person. I don't like, and I don't like the rejection of, you know, people walking by and you know, looking at your work and then walking on or saying, oh, you can bake that. Why don't you make one of the, you know, that kind of stuff. So, no, I don't I don't enjoy that that re retail meeting people thing. I don't care about that at all. So um, online is fine for me. You know, I don't have to, to interact. Although when teaching, it was more personal because it wasn't just somebody walking by your booth. You were actually interacting with people who were in the class, and so you kind of knew them. And in that, in that respect, it was fine. But just a cold kind of. Uh, are you still there? Yes. 
Oh, okay. You wouldn't wait know, for two some, seconds. <laughs> yeah, so, so, some incoming call. I can't stop those. Um, so I, I don't like the uh, setting up a tent and uh, all that kind of stuff. And it's a lot of work. No, a lot of work and not a lot of fun. Do you do a lot of custom orders or do you mostly create and sell what you make? Mostly what I make. Every once in a while, I'll do a custom thing, but um, and you know, it has its pluses and minuses. And uh, I would prefer just to make something. And if you like it and you want to buy it, fine. If you don't, then, you know, don't. But it's it's sometimes just difficult to 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 have some uh, somebody else give you an idea, and then you go back and forth. Oh, that's not what I meant. Mm -hmm. You know, change this. So, you know, I, I've been fortunate to work with some people who give me quite a bit of uh, leeway in executing those things. So it hasn't been bad, very, but I don't do very many. You don't encourage it. I do not. <laughs> so don't be, don't be asking me. <laughs> <It makes sense. laughs> yeah, so I had an, another artist ask me if I, we could do a barter. Um, he, he wanted to have a commission worked in. And I said, well, for you, because I think I understand. I've been you know, watching your work and watching you for a while. And I, I think we're on the same plane. But normally I would say no, because I always... I tend to lowball my custom work and then put in twice as much work into the piece sure. and afraid of yeah. disappointing somebody. And then I feel bad right. that I made zero dollars on that piece. Yeah. And it, I might fall, do the same thing. And yeah. then I worry, are they happy? Are they not? I, I, I care too much, maybe. So it's more fun just to create. And if they like it, they buy it. So exactly. I agree with you. I'll go on. Yeah. All right. So this is my favorite part because, you know, I'm a tool junkie. Having owned mm. a jewelry tool and supply company for 10 years, I really love tools. And so I like to know always it's interesting to me to know the top 10 tools of the artists that I interview. And so we're going to start with your number 10. So David Letterman style. Some people don't remember mm -hmm. know who he is, but you you and I yeah. watched him. Yes, we have. <laughs> I guess. So for your well, number 10 is Hauser and Miller for Bimetal. And um, mm -hmm. I heard yesterday that they are going out of business. So I Oh, really? No, I hadn't heard that. I contacted them today to buy some more stuff, and they didn't say anything about going out of business. And I asked them, but they haven't um, replied. So I just wanted to let you know that that's what I heard. But in case you need right. to get some more buy metal, that <laughs> you might want to try that. Um, somebody is, um, Estelle Vernon on our group is starting a uh, mass, a group buy with another company if you're interested in getting any buy metal if you can't get it from Hauser and Miller and you need some. So I thought I would let you know. Good, thank you. Uh, your number? I hadn't heard that. And so where do you use your buy metal at? Is it just in certain um, places? Yeah, here and there, just add a little gold, mm -hmm. you know, somewhat inexpensively, as little as I can. So I don't, I don't do it very often, but every once in a while, I like to have some on hand. And what color do you like to use? What carrot? I, I think I've been using the 22. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's 22? very pretty. A 18 or 22, I can't remember. And yeah. your number nine is the leather bolo cord from Thunderbird Supply Company. And mm -hmm. use that yeah, they're for the really chain? good. Use that for your chain? Uh, for bolos mostly, but oh. I've used them for neck cord. Yep. Once in a while. Do you yeah. ever do hat bands? Not with that material, I have not. No, I'm actually I haven't ever made a hat band. I, I, they oh, nice. Well, made one. Cut up an old belt and <laughs> put it on there. I think they're yeah. coming back in style, the the Western ones. I see a lot of um, Native Americans that I follow that are making and restoring old hats and making like new Thunder hats. Like Thunder Voice. Yeah. Thunder Voice Hat Company. Yeah. 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 I want to buy one of theirs, but it's pricey. Getting pricey now. Yeah. They have that turquoise one that's pretty pretty. <laughs> uh, not my color. <laughs> it's more of a For girl's a hat? hat. It's more of a girl's I hat. I think so. <laughs> I think so. Your number eight is your Prips Flex Fluoride Free for fire coat protection. And thanks to COVID, it's very hard to get now. Is it? It's out of oh, stock everywhere. Wow, I'm glad I got my gallon here. Then. Yeah, so don't tell anyone. That might be the thing they break in and take if they know anything about jewelry. 
Yeah. All right. No, it's good stuff. I like it. I, I've used other liquid fluxes, but uh, mm-hmm. Fripps, I think, is the best. Do you spray it on? It, it, I do. Yeah. yeah, spray. It's the only thing I yeah. use. I love it, except for if I'm working with Argentium. Then I guess you're not supposed uh, to use it with it. I don't know. So something about, I don't know. I, I've heard that there's it can be a problem. So I've been using uh, the Purple Flux for that. But yes, Prips is amazing. Love it. Uh, your number seven is the uh, Revere pliers that you can get at Auto Fry. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I like those pliers. And you don't I had a chance to uh, teach at Revere Academy and mm-hmm. kind of got hooked on them. And you don't mind yeah. that they don't have anything on the handles? I don't. No. I have I not tried fine. those. Yeah, no, I like them. Uh, I mean, I like Wubbers is the other ones that I really like too, but um, the ones that I have on the bench all the time are the Revere ones. And I like they don't have the springs in them. Yep. Yeah, those are nice. And your number six is the Miter Vice, which I can't live without. Yep. Yep. No, that's a must have. Have you ever had yours get stuck? Mine was yes. getting stuck today. How did you <laughs> clean it? I, I used a compressor and I put some lube in there, but I don't. I don't know if I need. I don't know. Else. I don't understand it either. Sometimes they just stick, and especially if they're new, sometimes they stick. I don't. I don't know what it is. Um, they seem to work better dry than even lubricated mm-hmm. for me. So. I think I got some wax in there because I like to use sticky wax, and I think that might have gotten in there, and and now it's sticking. <laughs> Sticky wax sticking. Okay, I can see why that could be a problem. Okay. Your number five are the digital calipers from Auto Fry. Yep, or Harbor Freight or wherever you can get them. I bought yeah. mine on Amazon and I love them. Um, I used to sell yes. the cheaper ones like that and they sometimes would stick, but I got this oh. new one from, I wanted to start a Sturette one and it I think they sold it to me as a Sturette, but it wasn't a Sturette. So it was something else and it works very nicely. But having a pair of those is uh, definitely essential for working. Yeah, you want to make sure you get the ones with the metal jaws, not the plastic ones, because you want to be able to scribe with it as well. Yes. And your number four is Santa Fe Jeweler Supply for Turquoise. Right. Now, They're a great place. You used to live there. So did you just drive down and get your stuff at their? Yep. Yeah. Or yes, Rio? indeed. Yeah. I, was, I was spoiled. Yes. Very spoiled. Spoiled rotten there and live in Santa Fe. Yes. Yeah. And uh, you could get things from Rio in a day easily. Yeah. Uh, but to walk into Santa Fe Jewelry Supply, that's yeah, great. Yeah. Yes. Nice place to live. Why did you leave? I didn't like the winters. Uh-huh. There's about six months of winter. Yes. Um, so I'm a California person, so warm it was weather. nice. Yeah, but and your family a little more on family here as well. Yeah, so that's but, nice. Right. Uh, your number three is your Sterno Butane torch from Amazon, and uh, where do you find the tanks for that? Because you just get those uh, on Amazon too. You can get them on Amazon. Uh, usually, you can find them at Ace Hardware. Oh. And, <clears throat> Excuse me. And um, most of the uh, restaurant supply places carry those because a lot of those are used for yes. uh, from brulee type torches. And they happen to be in our little local uh, grocery store because there are a lot of people who come in this area for camping. So that oh. those uh, butane tanks fit on camping stoves. So um, the Mexican and the Oriental markets sometimes Asian markets have them. Oh, I have one right down the road, so I'm going to go check because I have bought the top and yeah. couldn't find the fuel, and so I've never used it because I could only find the skinny oh. butane, you know, the skinny Yeah, the, the ones, the refills. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, these are, yeah, no. You'll find them. <laughs> but not not a, not a Home Depot or Lowe's. They, nope. I've never seen them. There. I looked there. They didn't have Ace. them. Okay. Try I will try Ace. that. Um, your number two is Rio Grande for silver. And that's yeah, where I get all my, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's either Auto Fry or Rio um, that I mostly get things from. Um, they, and they're both quick for shipping. Can't beat it. Yes. And their prices are about the same. Um, yep. I do have a teacher code for uh, Auto Fry, which saves 7%. If anybody would like that, 
uh, it I will put it in the comments section um, and it does save you a little bit on the metals as well so they don't tell you that but you can use it and it comes right off the top with the metals too um, and then your number one is uh, Gary and I, I, Gary's dangerous. I lose a lot of money to him every year at the Tucson Gym Show. And then he started doing Instagram sales. And of right. course, scarcity and urgency will get anyone to buy things that they don't need. You mm -hmm. see it, you know, you better get it because it won't be there. But he makes the most delicious cabs and stones, and he is the most delightful person to meet. And he actually lives in Tucson. So, mm -hmm. um, that's a really good resource and a lot of people don't know about him but he makes fabulous stones he does very unusual things and uh, a big variety uh, he's posting every day and uh, i just heard from him today that the uh, the ggx show in tucson has been canceled so he won't be selling it the gym show this year um, so I wonder go if online was... and uh, pick up yeah. from him online it's too bad that he won't uh, maybe do a different show because I know that uh, GL and W, which is Holodome and Gym Mall, sent out a notice saying, hey, whoa, everyone's saying that the gym show is, is closed down, but we're still open. You can register today. And I know Pueblo also and 22nd Street sent out a notice saying they're both going to be open. So it'll be a bummer that he's not at GJX or that GJX is not there. Um, right. Because where are we going to get our stones? But online, we'll just have to fight for it and scrap it out, I guess. Right. <laughs> yes, indeed. So yeah, no, he's the he's the go-to man for really interesting stuff. He is a really he's got an amazing eye for how to cut a stone. I do lapidary work also, so I try not to buy stones anymore because I should be cutting my own rough that I have in in boxes. Literally, mm -hmm. I move my rocks back and forth. My husband's like, what's in here? And I'm like, my rocks. And he's like, you're kidding, right? No, that's why it's heavy. But um, yeah, but sometimes you just can't, you don't get the rough that he does or the way that he cuts it and how he sees a stone. It's really very beautiful work. Worth the pennies. I agree. Yes. So I want to thank you for such an amazing interview and chat. I, I love getting to know the artists and what drives them and where they learned about art. I've learned so much about you and I've known you for a really long time. And actually I met your daughter um, many years ago, uh, 2009, yeah. I think it was, we were sitting at a dinner in uh, North Carolina and she said, oh, I, she asked me what I did, and I told her. And then she, she said, yeah, my dad, he, he does this stuff with metal and beads. And I'm like, well, who's your dad? Maybe I know him because at the time I had my company. And then she told me your name, and I said, what's wrong with you? He's, like, famous. Everybody loves him and his work, and they take his classes, and they fight over, you know, getting to know him and meet him. And she just thought that was the funniest thing ever because she doesn't see you that way but she is a right. beautiful person i just wanted to tell you how much i adore her and um and i'm and then i got Thank to meet you. you so it it made a lot of sense <laughs> well it's been nice to meet you and I'm, i really appreciate you uh, taking time to arrange all this online interview and um, we'll see where it goes from there and I did. Are we going to talk about the uh, discount? Yes, I did promise the, the group members that there would be a special offer that you so generously were going to give. And I know right. that you have two online classes right now that you're currently teaching: the art of etching, which I have up on the screen right now, and right. the heirloom locket, which is the second class. But I'm right. also here to announce that he has a new class coming out at the end of the month, a third class called the Class class which is hard for me to say right. and That's he fun. is that one is going to come out in a couple weeks it's not ready yet for you to sign up for but if you want to sign up for the first two classes either either one one or two um you can save ten dollars off the class i incorrectly put ten percent it is actually ten dollars off each class um, by entering the code podcast p-o-d-c-a-s-t as the discount code when you go to richard's website and um, if you sign up for either the heirloom locket class or the art of etching class, which is this one that I'm showing right now on the screen, if you sign up for either one of those, you'll get an email for the new class, the clasp 
class and then you'll be able to use the code for that class as well so he's giving all the members ten dollars off each of the three classes you just have to do that you have to sign up for the one of the two first and then you can get the discount off of the new class so right. um uh, Richard, tell us again how long the code how the code will be good for a week, correct? On the first two classes? Correct. And One week from today for the heirloom locket and the etching class. Uh, and then anyone who signs up for the either of those classes, anyone who is enrolled there now will receive uh, an email with a, a new code for the upcoming class. The Great. class class. Great. Okay. So then, in the class class, we are gonna cover six different kinds of clasps from a uh, simple S hook through a box clasp uh, and some spring clasps and mechanisms in between. I'm signing up for that one for sure. I've taken quite a few oh, class okay. classes from Pat Flynn and from um, a couple other people, but you, you, it, it's always interesting to see how someone else interprets the technique differently. And there, um, some people will show you a faster way to do it versus you know, more elaborate. And I'm always interested in how I can make things more efficiently so I can make more money. So I like taking classes, even if I already know how to make that piece, um, because I know I'll learn something from how you do it, how your process is, because it's probably different from the other person that I took the class from. So I'm really looking forward to that class. And I may even do that, the locket class as well, just because your hinges are very different from somebody else's hinges that I've taken. So it's a, it's a nice way to just learn something else. And I think your prices on your classes are really great. So um, I wanna thank you Good. for um, for sharing those with us and sharing your blessing and then also giving our members the discount. But I wanna make sure our members know do not go post the code everywhere else. They have to come watch <laughs> the podcast to get the code. So don't share it. Uh, uh, yes. <laughs> yes. So yes. I want to thank you again for your time. And I'm looking forward to seeing what you create next. And this is where I was going to make sure everyone knew to go to Instagram to watch your stories because they're very right. inspiring. Um, I really love them. And to leave you comments. And after this podcast is over, I in the comment section, I will list all of Richard's website, his social media. But it's also on the screen in front of you. If you want to take a look over in the right-hand corner, it tells you his website, Instagram, and Facebook. But I will list them in the comments as well. And um, I want to thank all the members for attending the podcast we will be in december hopefully moving the old podcast to youtube and to an apple itunes channel so you'll you can check that out and then you can listen to them at your bench but you won't have the visuals on the itunes one and you can catch us again on december 16th at the same time 4 p.m pacific time for our last 2020 podcast with paulette Werger. So um, I hope you all have a great holiday and we'll see you in December. And thank you so much, Richard. I really, really appreciate it. Very welcome. Thank you. All right. I'll be stalking you. Go post okay. your stories. You. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Right. Bye. Bye. Hey.